some occasions or there are some times which are considered very blessed in the sight and in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Take example of Laylatul Qadr in which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said in a hadith that man qama Laylatul Qadri imanan wa ihtisaban ghufira lahu ma taqaddama min zambi that whoever stands in worship on the Laylatul Qadr on the night of power with iman, with faith, wa ihtisaban, with the intention of reward, then ghufira lahu ma taqaddama min zambi, then all his previous sins will be forgiven. Take another example of the 15th of Sha'ban. Again, a night which is considered very blessed in the eyes and in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it comes in a hadith of Tirmidhi, that once Sayyidah Aisha Danha, she was sleeping, and in the middle of the night she wakes up, and she finds that Rasulullah is not with her. So she goes, and she goes to Jannatul Baqi, the cemetery of Medina Munawwara, and she finds Rasulullah there praying for the deceased. So Sayyidah Aisha Danha asks Rasulullah or Rasulullah asks her, that do you think Allah and his Rasul has oppressed you? Upon which Sayyidah Aisha then had replied by saying that I thought that you had gone to visit one of your wives. Upon which Rasulullah replied that today or tonight is the 15th of Sha'ban. It is such a blessed night that Allah <coughs> subhanahu wa ta'ala he descends or he comes to the first sky and he forgives so many people that the number of people he forgives is equivalent to the hairs which are on the goats of the tribe of Banu Kalf. And other examples as well, take the example of Ibadah, worshipping on the night preceding Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha, comes in a hadith of Sunan ibn Majah that the Prophet Allah sallallahu alayhi wa has said that whoever worships on the night before Eid al-Fitr, on the night before Eid al-Adha, then his heart will not die on that day when everybody else's heart will die. So these are some examples throughout the year in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed special time and special occasion on his people that if they were to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if they were to make any supplication to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if they were to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive his people. Now this takes me on to the topic which I've just chosen just for today, is with regards to the month of Muhammad. <coughs> that the month of Muharram, which started yesterday by the way, is also one of those blessed months in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's one of those special months and, some, and it's one of those virtuous months in the sight and in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now it is mentioned in the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna izzata shuhuri inda Allah itna ashara shahran fi kitabillah يَوْمَ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ مِنْهَا أَرْبَعَةٌ حُرْضٍ وَالْأَرْضَ مِنْهَا Leave it up to me. Now the first part of the verse which is of Surah Al-Tawbah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that there are 12 months in a year which has been decreed and which has been ordained by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before He created this world. That before this world was created, before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the heavens and so on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he set or he made 12 months. Even though according to different religions, they have different names for these months. Some call it January, some may call it something else. However, the 12 months in a year, this is something which was decreed and ordained by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as mentioned in that particular verse. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then goes on to say, Minha arba'atun huru. That out of those 12 months, they are four months which are sacred. They are four months which are honored. Now, what are those four months? It comes in a hadith of Sahih al Bukhari narrated by Sayyiduna Abu Bakr anhu, that the Prophet of Allah has said that the four months which are sacred are Zulqada, Zulhijjah, 
Muharram and Rajab. Zul Qa'da, Zul Hijjah, Muharram and Rajab. That these four months are sacred. These four months are honored in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the same way if a person was to do good deeds during these four months, if a person was to do like more good deeds, then obviously his reward will multiply in these four months. Similarly, if a person was to do anything bad, similarly if a person was to do anything sinful, anything evil in these four months, then his sins will also be multiplied. And this is the view of Hafiz bin Kathir, rahmatullahi, a very famous scholar of Tafsir. Now when he comes to interpret the next part of Surah Tawbah when he says, فَلَا تَظْلِمُوا فِيهِنَّ أَنفُسَكُمْ That do not transgress or do not go beyond the limit in these four months. Meaning that in these four months, just do ibadah, just do worship. Do not disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do not go over the limit, do not go beyond the limit things which you are not allowed to do, things which is prohibited for you to do, then refrain from this prohibition during those four months. Why? Because if you were to do any prohibited act during those four months, then the sin will uh, multiply and it will be very, very severe in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm-hmm. When we look at this verse of Surah Tawbah, if you look at the revelation, why this particular verse was revealed, it comes, the scholars of Tafsir have written that many of the Arabs at that time they were from the progeny or they were from the descendants of Sayyiduna Ibrahim alayhi salam and Sayyiduna Ismail alayhi salam. So even though they weren't practicing believers, they weren't like, they didn't have the concept of Tawheed. They obviously, because of many, many, because time has passed and eroded, so the concept of Tawheed slowly, slowly eroded from their hearts. So even though they weren't practicing believers, but they were from the descendants of Sayyiduna Ibrahim alayhi salam and Sayyiduna Ismail alayhi salam. So even the disbelievers who had gone away from the teachings of Ibrahim and Ismail alayhi salam, they still recognized the significance of these four months. And even before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prophethood, these four months were considered sacred. And they considered it unlawful, they considered it haram and impermissible to actually hurt someone during those four months. And even this is like an Islamic ruling, but they themselves would consider it like in, uh, impermissible and unlawful to wage wars, to wage battles during those four months. Instead, they would refrain from you know, uh, having battles, they would refrain from waging wars against another tribe during those four months. However, the other Arabs, so there were some Arabs who were from the descendants and progeny of Ibrahim alayhi salam, <coughs> and there were other Arabs who are known as pagans, i.e. they were mushrik. They you know, totally forgot the teachings of Ibrahim alayhi salam and instead chose the way of shirk, chose the way of ascribing partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the pagan Arabs, their whole life revolved about fighting, how to deceive other people. Their whole life was about killing, was about fighting, raging wars and so on. And what the pagan Arabs would do is that they would change the mud. They would say that this is Muharram, everybody knew it was haram and unlawful to fight and wage war in Muharram. But what the pagan Arabs would do, they would say, oh this is not Muharram, this is Safar. Or when Zul Qaeda will come, they would say, oh this is not Zul Qaeda, this is uh, Shawwal. Or when Zil Hijjah will come, they would say, oh this is not Zil Hijjah, this is like Rabiul Awwal and so on. So they would change the months like this, upon which this particular verse was revealed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that the 12 months, they have been preordained by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in taqdeer before we were created, before our souls were even created, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wrote faith and wrote the taqdeer, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had written that there will be 12 months in a year, this month will be Muharram, this will be Safar, this will be Rabbiul Awwal, Rabbiul Thani and so on. So for you to do these kind of things, I to change the months, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this verse, a verse indicating the unlawful nature of changing the months, which, and in particular, fighting and these kind of things, uh, changing the four months, i.e. Zul Qa'da, Zul Hijjah, Muharram and Rajab. Now, moving along a bit further, <coughs> as we just discussed and derived that the month of Muharram is considered virtuous in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's considered sacred in the sight and eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can see from the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or from the practice of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that Rasulullah would engage or would increase his worship and ibadah during this particular month. 
And it comes in a hadith of Sahih al-Muslim, narrated by Sayyiduna Abu Hurayr al-Anhu, that the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said, that afzalu siyami ba'da shahri Ramadan. That the best fasting after the month of Ramadan. So in the month of Ramadan, everyone is, it's, it's obligatory upon every one of us to fast. But after the month of Ramadan, there are 11 months. So Rasulullah is saying that besides the month of Ramadan, the other 11 months, the most beloved time or the best time to fast is Shahrullah al Muharram. Is in the month of Allah, i.e., Muharram. Now, in this particular hadith, one thing we can understand and derive that it is considered virtuous to keep optional fast and increase your option of fasting during this particular month. But the second thing we can also derive is that in this hadith, Rasulullah has attributed the month of Muharram to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now those of you who probably studied a bit of Arabic will know that when you attribute something to someone, like which is known in Arabic as Muzaf, Muzaf ilay, then that, when you attribute something to the Muzaf ilay, the Muzaf, i.e. the thing which you are attributing, that is something uh, like it shows the significance or the importance or the sacred nature of that particular thing. So in this hadith, Rasulullah is saying that the month of Allah is Muharram, indicating that this is a month of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this month belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, indicating towards the sacred nature of this particular month. Now the next point which we're going to look at, and this is a very important point, is why do we fast in the month, or in the, obviously one of the special days of the month of Muharram is called Ashura. It's called the 10th of Muharram. Now the issue which we're going to look at is that how did the day of Ashura or the 10th of Muharram come about? And why is it considered mustahab and desirable for Muslims to fast on this particular day? Now the day of Ashura didn't start, or the basis of it, didn't start during Rasulullah's time. But it relates to an incident or to a story which happened between Sayyiduna Musa salam and the Jews and the Pharaoh and Fir'aun and so on. Now the full transcript of the hadith is a hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih al-Muslim narrated by Sayyiduna Ibn Abbas al anhu That when Rasulullah sallam migrated to Medina Munawwara, he saw the Jews, they were fasting. So Rasulullah asked the Jews that what are you doing? So they replied that we are fasting and so on. Why? Because on this day, i.e. the 10th of Muharram, the day of Ashura, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved Musa alayhi salam from the enemy. And who was the enemy of Sayyiduna Musa alayhi salam? It was Fir'aun, it was the Pharaoh and his soldiers and his army. So on this day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he saved Musa alayhi salam and as a token of gratitude as a thank you Musa alayhi salam he fasted on this day so therefore we i.e. the Jews are fasting on this particular day upon which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa replied by saying that we are more closer to Musa alayhi salam than you that we have more right to Musa alayhi salam or more right to Musa alayhi salam than you and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa fasted on this day and he ordered the sahabas and the companions to also fast on this particular day as well so this is the, where the day of Ashura, the fasting of the day of Ashura, the fasting on the 10th of Muharram, the desirability of fasting on this particular day comes from. Now what is the incident, what happened between Sayyiduna Musa salam, and Fir'aun and the Pharaoh? This is a story which inshallah we will look at later on in many places in the Holy Quran. It talks about, touches on the story of Sayyiduna Musa salam, and the Pharaoh and Fir'aun. Just very briefly, I'll just give a brief extract of the whole story which Hafiz bin Kasir rahmatullahi in his tafsir and similarly Imam Nasir rahmatullahi in his sunan have mentioned that as all of you are probably aware that Musa alayhi salam was raised in the household of the Pharaoh. He was actually raised in Pharaoh's household. He was raised by the Pharaoh's, the Fir'aun's, Fir'aun's wife, Hazrat Asiya radiallahu anha. And what happened was there was an incident which happened that Musa alayhi salam 
he hit or he struck one of the people of the Pharaoh, i.e. Egyptian, and he killed him. And then Pharaoh, the Pharaoh, he sent an army or a, some priests or someone to look for Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam, and Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam escaped from Egypt. Obviously, when we look at the story in more detail, we'll mention that why did it happen, why did he hit him, and so on. We'll look at those kind of issues later. So Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam, he escaped Egypt, he escaped Misr. And he went to a place called Madian, where there was a prophet in the name of Sayyiduna Shu'ib alayhi salam. And Musa alayhi salam, he married one of the daughters of Sayyiduna Shu'ib alayhi salam, and he was in the service or in the khidmah of Sayyidina Shaykh alayhi salam for 8 to 10 years as mentioned in the Holy Quran. Then after the 10 year period or the 8 year period, the two different opinions finished, Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam, because he had left behind his mother and sister in Egypt, he wanted to go back to Egypt and see them. So he asked permission <coughs> from Sayyidina Shaykh alayhi salam and accompanied with his daughter, i.e. his wife, they went to Egypt. Now, when they were making their way towards Egypt, they passed by, it was getting really dark at that time, and they passed by a mountain called Mantur. Now, because on those days, they didn't have like street lights to show the way you know, uh, to Egypt and so on. Musa alayhi salam, he kind of lost his direction. He didn't know where or which way to go towards Egypt. So on top of Mantur, he sees a light. He sees this kind of light, he sees a kind of fire, and he says to his wife that what I'll do is that, because sometimes when you're camping, what people do is that they kind of light a fire and they sit together. So he thought that there may be some people there, some travelers there. So I'll climb up Mount Tud, I'll go and see them, and they could tell me the direction towards Egypt. Or better still, I may even get some fire and then I would be able to get a torch of flame and then I would be able to make my way towards Egypt. When Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam, he climbed up Mount Tud, he didn't actually see a fire or anything, he actually saw a light, a nur coming from the sky. And obviously, when we look at the story in more detail, we mentioned that how this kind of light and mood was. It wasn't like, a, like an illumination the sky, it was something rather different. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to Musa alayhi salam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he made Musa alayhi salam a prophet, and he ordered Musa alayhi salam to go to Egypt, why? And convey the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Fir'aun and to the Pharaoh. And, and as mentioned in the Holy Quran, Inna hu tawa, why? Because Fir'aun has transgressed. What was the transgression of Fir'aun? Fir'aun, he claimed to be a god. He made people worship him. He claimed to be a god and so on. And he told people to worship him. And if they didn't, then he would severely punish them, beat them up and so on and so forth. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made Musa alayhi salam a prophet. And he also made his brother, Musa alayhi salam's brother, Harun alayhi salam, his khalifa, his deputy. And both now, instead of going to visit their uh, sister and their mother, they now made their way towards, uh, towards the Pharaoh. At that time, Harun alayhi salam, he was in Egypt as well. So they made their way towards the Pharaoh. Now when they went to the Pharaoh, when they went to Pharaoh, they conveyed the message that to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first thing Pharaoh said that I don't believe you, and he said to them, them that show me a miracle. That if you show me a miracle, then I may listen to you what you are saying. So the first miracle which Musa alayhi salam showed the Fir'aun, showed the Pharaoh, was that he had a stick with him. And he tapped it on the ground and that stick turned into a big massive serpent. And the second miracle which Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam showed Fir'aun was that Musa alayhi salam, he had his hand, he put it underneath his armpit. And he took it out, and his hand he started shining. Then after that, Musa alayhi salam, he put his hand again underneath his armpit, and he took it out again, and it became normal. So these were two miracles which Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam showed the Pharaoh and showed the Pharaoh. Now when Pharaoh, when the Pharaoh saw this, he was really impressed, and he was like thinking, well, this is amazing. So what he did was that he held a meeting with his advisors, known as the Wuzara, the ministers. But the ministers, they gave him a bad advice. And they told the Pharaoh that this is nothing. He's not a messenger from Allah. He's not a messenger from God. He's not a Rasul from God. This is sorcery. This is like magic at his best. And he gave the advice to Fir'aun that what we will do is that we will hold this kind of festival and this kind of event 
will call all the best magicians of Egypt, of Misr, and they will easily overpower the sorcery and the magic of Sayyidina Musa. So again, as we probably heard the story, they all got together, there was this kind of big massive festival, and uh, the challenge was, firstly, Sayyidina Musa Islam told their own, uh, the Egyptian magician to throw the stick, so they threw the stick and it turned into small snakes. Then Musa Islam tapped his stick on the ground, it turned into a big massive snake and he ate the little snakes up. And then what happened was when the magicians saw this, they were impressed and they believed in the, uh, Sayyidina Musa Islam and they believed in the creator and the god of Sayyidina Musa Islam. After which Fir'aud, he punished them and he killed them as mentioned in the Holy Quran. Obviously when we look at the story in more detail, we will look at <coughs> every single aspect in more detail. Now after that particular incident, Musa Islam and the Jews, Banu Israel, they were still living in Egypt, they were still living in Misr. And during that time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he sent various calamities and disease upon the people of Misr, or upon or in Misr and in Egypt. And it's mentioned in the Holy Quran in Surah Al-A'raf, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes these calamities as ayati mufassalah, such as there was a tufan, there was a flood, there was locusts, there were lice, there were these kind of uh, insects were thrown at, uh, into Egypt where there were a lot of, of these kind of insects, frogs and so on and so forth. Now, at every single calamity, Sayyiduna, uh, sorry, at, yeah, at every single calamity, Fir'aun, the Pharaoh, he would go to Sayyiduna Musa salam, and he would say to him that, or pray to your God to eradicate or to get rid of these diseases and these calamities. And he promised Sayyiduna Musa salam, that if you do then I will free the Jews, I will free the children of Israel, I will free Banu Israel from slavery. So, according to this request, Sayyidina Musa salam, he prayed to Allah, and these calamities and these diseases which they were inflicted with, uh, would disappeared and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took it away. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took these diseases and these calamities away, Fir'aun, he went back on his promise. And instead of freeing the Banu Israel, instead of freeing the Jews, he still kept them as slaves. So the last order which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to Sayyidina Musa salam was that now leave Egypt with Banu Israel. Now leave Egypt with the Jews. So Sayyidina Musa salam, at night time, he left with the Jews, with the Banu Israel, with the children of Israel, and they were crossing the river. And as all of you know the story, Fir'aun and his armies and soldiers, they were following him. And when they crossed the river, and Fir'aun and his army were in the middle of the river, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered the waves to drown them, and this is how Fir'aun and his army were destroyed. Now because of this incident, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had saved the Jews, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had saved Banu Israel, as a thank you, as a token of gratitude, Musa alayhi salam fasted on the day of Ashura, on the 10th of Muharram. And because of this reason and because of the hadith, Rasulullah sallam then said that we are more closer to Musa sallam than you. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi sallam instructed the Muslims and the Sahaba to also fast on this particular day. Now the virtue or the virtues of this particular day isn't linked, as some people think, to the martyrdom of Sayyiduna Hussein Radil Some people think that the reason why we fast on this day is because Sayyiduna Hussein Radil who got martyred. Okay, that is totally untrue and totally incorrect. The reason why it obviously makes sense because Sayyiduna Hussein Radil was martyred many, many years after Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away. Now that would, Naudhubillah, will mean that during Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's time, our deen and our faith was incomplete. And because of an event afterwards, that's when a ruling is given. As all of you know that the verse that comes in the Quran, Al Yawma Akmaltu Lakum Deenakum. That way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals the verse and he says that today I have completed your deen and your faith for you. That's why you get the concept of bidah, that those actions, those things which were not done during Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa time, not done during the Sahaba's time, then they are called a bidah, they are called an innovation. Why? Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has perfected and has completed the deen and the faith for us on well, uh, when this verse was revealed, which happened to be on the 9th of Zul Hijjah, on the day of Arafah, in the farewell Hajj. So, the reason why we fast on the 10th of Muharram isn't because of an incident which happened many, many years after. And another way to look at it is that 
after Rasulullah passed away, there were many other Sahabas who were martyred. There were many, many other Sahabas who sacrificed their life. But we don't have a date for them to commemorate their death or anything like that. So why is it like, why is, the, uh, why is it so special regarding Sayyidina Hussain that we have to commemorate his death? Take an example of Sayyidina Umar bin Khattab who Rasulullah has said that if there was a prophet after me, Lakana Umar bin Khattab he would have been Umar bin Khattab anhu. Umar bin Khattab anhu, many verses were revealed according to his desires and according to his wishes. He was martyred. But again, we don't have a date where we commemorate the death and the martyrdom of Sayyidina Umar bin Khattab anhu. Look at Sayyidina Uthman ibn Anhu, he was also martyred, but again we don't have a date or a, uh, or a time where we commemorate the death of Sayyidina Uthman ibn Anhu. So what we say is that obviously the death and the martyrdom of Sayyidina Hussain ibn Anhu is something which was very tragic. And obviously it hurts and it should hurt every single Muslim to see the grandson of Rasulullah being martyred uh, like that. However, it does the, the virtues of Muharram of fasting on the 10th of Ashura isn't linked with the martyrdom of Sayyiduna Hussein Now just moving a bit further the, going back to the fasting part of it now now obviously the fasting on the 10th of Muharram as I mentioned that the reason why we fast the reason why it's considered mustahab and desirable to fast is because of the incident between Musa salam and the Pharaoh and his enemies and this fasting is something which was even practiced by the people of Jahiliya. Those people during the days of ignorance, the pagan Arabs, even the Arabs before the advent of Rasulullah and Islam, they would even fast during the day of Ashura, during the 10th of Muharram. Even to the extent that it has been narrated that Imam Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi and Imam Malik rahmatullahi were of the view that the fasting of Ashura, the fasting on the 10th of Muharram, was compulsory before uh, R- Ramadan became first. That before the fast of Ramadan became compulsory and first, it was considered compulsory to fast on the day of Ashura. Imam Shafi and Imam Ahmed, on the other hand, of the view that to fast on the day of Ashura wasn't considered first. So from this we can understand that the fasting on the 10th of Muharram on the day of Ashura was a practice which was done before Rasulullah time and done before the prophethood of Rasulullah We take on to the next point and that is with regards to the virtues of fasting on the day of Muharram. Now it comes in a hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari, sorry, uh, Sahih al-Muslim narrated by Sayyidina Ibn Abbas ibn Anhu that the Prophet of Allah has said that whoever fasts on the 10th of Muharram on the day of Ashura then it is an expiation or it is a kafara for his previous year's sin. So any kind of sin, minor sins which he had done before, then by just fasting on the day of Ashura, all his previous sins will be forgiven. Whereas fasting on the day of Arafah, which has already gone the ninth of Zul Hijjah, then in the Hadith of Sayyid Muslim says that his previous sin, year's sins will be forgiven and similarly his following year's sins will be forgiven. So with regard to the day of Ashura, only your previous sins will be forgiven and remember the sins here means minor sins as, as was discussed last week that for major sins you need Tawbah and you need repentance. So that is the virtue of fasting on the day of Ashura. Which takes me on to the next Muslim and the next point is that how many days do you have to fast? Do you, can you just fast on the 10th of Muharram or do you have to fast one day before or one day after? Now it is considered mustahab and desirable to fast two days. Okay, not just on the 10th of Muharram, on Yawmi Ashura, but it's also considered mustahab and desirable to either fast on the 9th and the 10th or the 10th and the 11th. Okay, so it's mustahab and desirable to fast on the 9th of Muharram along with the 10th of Muharram or 10th and the 11th. Now, which takes me on to the next point, and that is that if someone did just fast on the 10th of Muharram, what would happen? Now, the ruling is that if someone just fast on the 10th of Muharram, then it's not considered makruh and it's not considered dislike. Even scholars such as Ibn Taymiyyah rahmatullah in his Majmul Fatawa has written that if a person was to just fast on the 10th of Muharram, then it's not considered makruh. Even Hafiz bin Hajar al haythami a famous Shafi scholar, has even said the same thing. And that is that if a person was to fast 
on the 10th of Muharram, just on the 10th of Muharram, then it's not considered makru. Many people are on the assumption that if you just fast on the 10th of Muharram, it's considered makru. It isn't. It's mustahab to fast on both days, 9th and the 10th, but if you can't for some reason and you just fast on the 10th, then it is permissible and it is okay. Now, some of you may think to yourself that, but the Jews fast on the 10th, so therefore, if we fast on the 10th by ourselves, then we are imitating the Jews. And it comes to the hadith that Man tashabbaha bikawmin fahuwa minhum that whoever imitates a group of people, then they will be raised alongside them on the Day of Judgment. Now, the answer to that particular objection will be that the Jews, even in even this day and age, they still fast on the 10th of Muharram. But the thing is, that the Jews, they don't follow the lunar calendar. They follow the solar calendar. So their 10th of Muharram, according to the solar calendar, is totally different from our 10th of Muharram. Whenever their 10th of Muharram is, it'll either be 2-3 months that side or 2-3 months later or 2-3 months after. Why? Because the Jews, they follow the solar calendar and not the lunar calendar. Whenever their 10th of Muharram is according to the solar calendar, it's not going to be 10th of Muharram according to our Islamic calendar. And just to give an example of the hadith which I mentioned of Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, that when Rasulullah was the beginning of the hadith, that when Rasulullah migrated to Medina Munawwara, what was the hadith? He saw the Jews fasting. Now it comes in the books of Sikh and books of Sirat that Rasulullah does anyone know when he migrated to Medina Munawwara? He migrated in Rabiul Awwal. Rasulullah migrated to Medina Munawwara in the month of Rabiul Awwal. And what were the Jews doing? They were fasting on the 10th of Muharram, which is two months later. So, or if you want to look at the other way, eight months uh, be, uh, behind. So, what we can see is that even the Jews during Rasulullah's time, they were fasting, they were keeping the day of Ashura fast when? In Rabiul Awwal. So what we can see is that they acting on the solar calendar and not on the lunar calendar. So even though they, if they just fast on one day, their fasting on one day isn't exactly the same as the 10th of Muharram in the lunar calendar. So therefore that objection that oh, you're imitating the Jews by just fasting on one day does not, uh, uh, does not uh, stay. And obviously and another thing which you need to keep in mind, and that is it comes in the hadith of Sahih al-Muslim, narrated by Sayyidina Ibn Abbas al Anhu that Rasulullah throughout his whole life, he only fasted on the 10th of Muharram. It's in a hadith of Sahih al-Muslim where Rasulullah said that if I live the next year, or if I live the following year, then I will fast on the 9th. Throughout his whole life, Rasulullah just fasted on the 10th. But in, he made a wish, a desire, a tamanna, as we say in Urdu, that if I was to live for the following year, or if I was to be alive the following year, then I will fast on the 9th of Muharram as well. So we can't consider it to be makru and dislike to just fast on the 10th, where it was a practice of Rasulullah that he fasted on the 10th of Muharram his whole life. And this is a view, this is what Ibn Qayyim rahmatullah has mentioned as well, that it is incorrect for someone or to give the ruling or the fatwa or the judgment of detestability on an individual who just fast on the 10th of Muharram. Why? Because it hasn't been uh, narrated or it's not established that Rasulullah fasted on the uh, 9th of Muharram. So keeping this in mind, the scholars have said that it's mustahab desirable to fast on both days. And because the days are very short, so it is possible to fast both days. But if you can't, just for example, you're studying or you got uni or what, madrasa or you're working and so on, you find it difficult, then at least uh, fast on the 10th of Muharram and as we can see from the reward that a person who does fast then all his previous sins will be forgiven. Now I'll just finish off the talk by just mentioning one thing and that is that there are many kind of evil practice or some kind of like love innovations which are attached to this particular date or this particular date and many of them are not true. Okay, the, like for example there is some mention that some people say that Sayyiduna Adam alayhi salam, he was created on this day, or he was created on this particular day. Now, there aren't any hadiths regarding that, that which say that Sayyiduna Adam alayhi salam was created on the 10th of Muharram. It's mentioned in some books, however, if you look at the books, the scholars will say that some people have said this, however, there aren't any 
uh, hadiths or the hadith which are, have been mentioned are very, very weak or some have even said that they are fabricated hadiths. Similarly, some people have the view that on the 10th of Muharram, Qiyamah and Day of Judgment will take place. So again, some scholars have mentioned it, however, there isn't a hadith supporting their particular opinion. And also other views such as that whoever takes a bath on the 10th of Muharram, then he will never get, never ever get ill. So these kind of things are not mentioned, they're not substantiated from any particular hadith. So therefore, uh, we should try and refrain from uh, mentioning these. Obviously, we can't say like such a, such, a, such a scholar has said this, but to you know, act upon it and to deem it necessary to act upon it, then that would be something which is uh, not good. And another kind of misconception or an evil custom which is associated with the month of Muharram is that because it was a month in which Sayyidina Hussein al Anhu got martyred, many people deem this particular month to be unlucky, like it's kind of like an unlucky month. Now, there's no such thing as like super, you know, superstitious things and these kind of things, lucky and all this kind of stuff. There's no such thing as like that in Islam. And it's quite clear in a hadith where Rasulullah when he was talking, uh, it's a hadith of Mushkat and Masabi, where Rasulullah has said, Wala safra. That it was a custom of people that they would think that the month of suffer to be evil, to be unlucky and so on. They would refrain from getting married in this month. They would refrain from doing some kind of business and transactions in, month, in this month. So Rasulullah has said that these kind of things like superstitious things, you know, unlucky things, charms and these kind of things, these are practices of the Jahiliyyah. These are the practices of the people of Jahiliyyah, the, before Rasulullah the <laughs> time, those people, the pagan Arabs who were there, it was their practices to think of these kind of things and to say that this time is unlucky or this uh, uh, particular bird is unlucky and this particular uh, animal is unlucky and so on. These things are not associated with Islam. So to think that this month is something which is unlucky, then again, that is incorrect and that is not one of our beliefs. So may Allah subhanahu to give us the Tawfiq tracks when I've been said, Waqir Da'a Wan, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alam. Does anybody have any questions or? Inshallah, next week we'll start the, we'll continue with the Tawfiq. Allahumma alayhi wa sallam, alayhi wa sallam, sabarak ta yazad jalali wa likram. Allahumma atina fi dunya hasna ta wa sallam, 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 wa sallam,